Hello, I'm uh, Chris Leishman, Professor of Housing Economics at the University of Adelaide and currently also a visiting professor at the University of Sheffield. In addition to my Australian housing research interests, I coordinate the Understanding Housing Markets theme of the UK Housing Evidence Centre. And of course, I've got a long history working on housing development and supply focused research projects. So I've been asked to talk about the house building sector in Australia and the UK and to focus on both a long term and a shorter term question. And having watched all of these videos in the series so far, I note that one of the recurring themes is the notion that the UK and Australian housing systems are similar, but also quite different. And so I hope to add a bit more to that line of thinking as well. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the construction sector has been put forward as a potentially important conduit for stimulus measures. Now, the main economic argument for this is that construction is thought to give rise to a decent multiplier effect and quite a direct and rapid route from government spending to wider impacts on consumption. In Australia, the community housing industry has also been quick to respond to the potential opportunity and has been active in putting together lists of so-called shovel-ready projects that can be commissioned later in the year, when private sector activities been widely forecast to begin drying up. The Australian Commonwealth Government's main response so far has actually generated a fair amount of criticism and also perhaps disappointment. So the new home builder policy allows home owner occupiers to qualify for a $25,000 home renovation grant, provided that they intend to spend $150,000 or more of their own money and employ tradesmen or builders to carry out the majority of the work. It can also be used as a cash grant towards building a new home. And the cost of the policy has been set at $688 million. And it's fair to say that there's been quite a strong chorus of protests from commentators and groups sympathetic to public and community housing interests. In fact, the, the consensus view seems to be that anyone able to commit to a renovation or new build project this year was probably going to do it anyway. It's not yet clear whether there will be a larger scale construction stimulus later in the year, but it does now seem to be the case that the government's quite focused on the end of the JobKeeper programme on 27th of September. At the end of last week, the government announced that childcare will be the first of the economic sectors to be withdrawn from this subsidy. And the expectation is that other sectors will be withdrawn in due course. So the construction stimulus measures announced so far seem quite um, short term and focus. Of course, there may be more to follow. One of the arguments put forward in favour of focusing on public house building is that the low to medium density developments favoured by this sector rely mainly on Australian made construction materials. The larger higher density developments found mainly in the private sector have a um, much heavier reliance on imported materials. But of course the more important argument is that greater public good can be created by stimulating public or community house building. And it's worth saying that even the private house building interests in Australia are now commenting that the home builder policy is too narrow in its focus at the moment and that a wider form of stimulus measures might be needed later in the year. <clears throat> in the first few weeks of the pandemic, there were plenty of reports of uh, rationing of some building materials, including, for example, el electrical components. But it's fair to say that initial concerns about sourcing materials a few months ago haven't actually played out and become a real problem so far in the construction industry, at least in Australia. The situation may be different, of course, in other countries. In some parts of Australia, uh, including uh, particularly Western Australia, subdued housing and construction activity for several years before the pandemic are thought to have eroded the availability of skilled labour. And this might actually limit the potential of using the construction industry for stimulus purposes. In the UK, even before the pandemic, the Letwin Review noted that uh, the house building industry has an exposure to an inadequate supply of skilled bricklayers. In fact, skilled shortages have uh, been seen as a problem in the, the industry for nearly 20 years in the UK. So I think that one interesting question for panellists to consider is this, just how much capacity does the residential construction industry have if it's to be used to create economic stimulus? And a linked question um, is to what extent are labour or material shortages likely to constrain that capacity? So the second set of issues I'd like to talk about 
um, actually refers to a longer term question. In fact, I think we, we could usefully divide it into two related sub questions. So the first of these considers the impacts that planning has on the elasticity of housing supply itself and then on the price of housing uh, in general. In Australia, there's been a recent uh, very vibrant or perhaps even heated debate about this. And unsurprisingly, some very polarized views have emerged. Now, I don't want to review any of those studies in any detail, but I do think it's worth making some general points about this debate. So let's assume for a moment that there are two extremes with the quantitative economist view on one hand that planning significantly reduces supply elasticity and raises housing prices. On the other extreme, there's recognition that planning also reduces negative externalities and it facilitates quasi-public goods, including infrastructure investment. So in other words, the more balanced view is that planning delivers value in other ways which offset the reduced supply responsiveness. Studies of the costs of planning are not exactly new, but actually have a long history in housing studies. And there's a general acceptance that price effects are actually only one factor. Non-price effects might include things such as undesirable design features, designed to maximize site value while staying within planning rules. They also include things like administrative delays and a reduced responsiveness of developers. We should also recognize that studies that estimate the house price premium associated with planning are usually quite careful to point out that reforming planning will not necessarily reduce prices, and certainly not by the amount of the estimated premium to begin with. A since we published UK Housing Evidence Centre report re-examined some of these issues from the perspective of developers based in Scotland and Northern Ireland. So the interviews we carried out actually suggest that the main difficulties with planning concern the large number of consultees involved in the process, uh, the variable speed of, of their engagement and the speed of the planning process itself. Developers talked about uh, lack of coordination between planning and infrastructure providers. They referred to various attempts to reform the planning processes, which in their view have done nothing to sort out the underlying problems. And interestingly, developers in Northern Ireland and Scotland uh, who face very different systems and planning reform histories still talk in terms of developers needing three to five years to bring a development site through the planning system. But to help balance the argument, I think it's also fair to say that while planning may reduce the supply elasticity, it's actually also in developers' interests, at least to a certain extent, not to supply too much to the market um, at any one time. So the UK's Barker Review marked a move from medium term to much longer term economic models of housing supply and affordability. And one of the most important innovations, in my view, was the recognition that most of the annual supply of housing is actually generated from the existing housing stock. So new build supply matters because it increases the size of housing stock, but of course only at a very slow rate. This means that new supply is important in the longer term, but we shouldn't expect to find a strong relationship between supply and prices in the short term. Around about the same time as the Barker Review, several behavioral studies were also commissioned by the UK government. And these tended to show that competition between developers for land is much greater than competition between them in the market for selling finished housing. In a rising market, it actually pays for developers to assume high rates of high, uh, house price growth and then bid high to secure the land they need, and then build out very slowly to capitalize on those rising house prices. So another key con conclusion of the series of behavioral studies that I'm uh, talking about was that local housing markets probably actually have a limited capacity to absorb new housing supply. This was put forward in several behavioral studies in the early to mid 2000s, and then finally made it as one of the key conclusions of the Letwin Review. <clears throat> so the second linked longer term sub question is actually another old favorite in housing studies. Why is the price elasticity of new housing supply so low and how has this actually affected housing prices? And at first glance, the UK and Australia might be seen to be moving in opposite directions on this one given the comments made earlier about the costs of planning debate we've recently had in this country. But in the UK, thinking seems to be changing. For example, the Bank of England now seems to view high housing prices as a function mainly of low interest rates. A recent working paper by Miles and Monroe showed that almost um, all of the increase in housing asset prices 
over the past 30 years are due to lower interest rates and higher real household incomes. A different working paper by MHCLG in 2018 estimated that between 1991 and 2016, population growth in England increased prices by 32%, and about two thirds of that was from net overseas migration, but that higher household incomes increased prices by 150%, and meanwhile, an increase in housing stock reduced prices by about 40%. Um, a recent paper by Mulhern also recently argued that um, a significant increase in new built housing supply in the UK would only lead to a reduction in prices of around 10%. In Australia, recent RBA modelling suggests that a 1% increase in Australian housing stock would reduce prices by 3.6% in the long run. And the Grattan Institute recently claimed that an additional 50,000 dwellings a year for a decade would lower prices by somewhere between 5 and 10%. And that might sound like a lot, but with an annual new build supply of around 150,000 dwellings, that's actually a huge increase in supply and a fairly modest predicted price effect. So to conclude on this point, I'm actually not sure that the two extremes in the debate are represented by economists on one hand and planners on the other, but perhaps the extremes are economists on one hand and then uh, simply a different set of economists on the other. So at one extreme, economic studies predict sometimes enormous increases in housing prices as a result of having planning controls. But at the other extreme, almost all the changes in house prices in the long run can be attributed to low interest rates and rising household in incomes. And so it seems that planning doesn't actually have much of an effect in the long run at all. So what needs to be done to ensure a smooth and effective stimulus? Well, in Australia, some of the recent debate actually does feel a bit dated and reminiscent of the UK debate perhaps 20 years ago. But one potential game changer is actually the role of net overseas migration. Before the GFC, new built supply added about 1% to the UK's housing stock each year. And since then, new supply has struggled to recover to that point, And it now adds something like half of 1% each year to, to the housing stock. By contrast, Australia's new housing supply level easily adds 2% a year to the housing stock. But of course, until the pandemic, net overseas migration was adding nearly 1% to Australia's population each year. By contrast, in the UK, international migration adds less than 0.4% each year. So it seems to me that before asking whether the new supply level is actually adequate, it seems important that we gain a better understanding of where international migration and policy might end up in Australia after the pandemic is over. So in summing up, some final comments for panellists uh, to think about and, and consider uh, are as follows. So critics of the Australian government's home builder grant point out that the stimulus effects would be similar, but that much more housing supply would be created if the money was spent on public or community house building. Critics also point out that not many people are likely to have $150,000 sitting around waiting to be spent on home renovation or new build. But if grants of $25,000 really do trigger expenditures of another $150,000 on construction work, then the combined leverage and multiplier effects could be substantial, at least in theory. Is it worth asking the question about whether we actually need an increase in new housing supply at all at the moment? Forecasts about declining rents and rising vacancy rates in the private rental sector suggest that the problem with supply is that it might be too focused um, on the wrong tenure. Certainly, our recent interviews with UK developers revealed that um, first-time buyers used to represent 40% or so of sales before the global financial crisis, and that's now fallen to something like 15%. And in both countries, developers have become heavily orientated towards investors uh, and it's clear that this market is now drying up very quickly. In the UK, the Litwin Review recently um, added the concept of increasing supply diversity to the other two elements of um, the English affordability strategy. The other two elements being increasing housing supply generally and improving the build out rate of development. And there's now a similar debate in Australia that increasing the, the diversity of supply might actually be more important than the supply level itself. So in closing, um, I hope that this brief set of comments and also theoretical musings are interesting and helpful, and I'm looking forward to sharing your own views in our panel sessions. Thank you.